Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our continuing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Charles Towns, who died recently at the age of 99. Charles Towns won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1964, along with the Russians Nikolai Basov and Alexander Prokhorov, who were working independently in the Soviet Union, for their work in masers, which is microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, which was the predecessor to what they also worked on, which were lasers, or light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Dr. Towns realized that you could amplify and stimulate the electrons of a molecule, and he used ammonia gas as his model to stimulate electrons to develop masers and ultimately lasers. So Dr. Towns is actually one of the fathers of lasers and all the attendant benefits that we accrue from them today. But he's far more than that. He's probably one of the great unheralded American scientists of the 20th century. And he researched in other fields, including nonlinear optics, radio astronomy, and infrared astronomy. He and his assistants also detected the first complex molecules in interstellar space, and they were the first to measure the mass of the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So you can't sell Dr. Towns' scientific achievements short, but one of the most amazing things about him is, for all his scientific prowess, he was also a deeply religious man. And what most of the obituaries failed to point out was, unlike a lot of other leading scientists, he refused to recognize a fundamental schism between religion and science. He deeply believed that religion and science complemented each other, which is quite an unusual view today. Dr. Towns was born in Greenville, South Carolina, the same hometown as Shoeless Joe Jackson. He graduated summa cum laude from Furman University in South Carolina, then went on to become a star student at Duke and later at Caltech. Here is South Carolina Educational TV on the career of Dr. Charles Towns. Charles H. Towns was born in Greenville, South Carolina, July 28, 1915, and grew up on a farm. I like the outdoors. I like natural history. I uh, like the stars, and I studied birds and flowers and insects and collected butterflies, and I was very interested in natural history and what the world was like. And when I took my first course in physics, I said, oh, that's very basic. You really try to understand things and how they work and why they work and so on. You have equations, you can work out things numerically, and you, oh, that's, that's just what I want. Town studied at Furman and Duke Universities, then headed west. Caltech at that time seemed to me the very best place. So I took a bus from uh, South Carolina out to California. And uh, it was easy to get into graduate school, but it was hard to get any financial help at that time. That was the years of the Depression. I went to Caltech, and after I'd been there one semester, they gave me a teaching assistantship. After getting his PhD, Towns moved back east to work for Bell Laboratories. As America prepared for World War II, theoretical physics had to take a backseat to application. I didn't want to do engineering. I wanted to do physics. But I had to do it. So I started working on radar, and I learned a great deal from that. That was very important to me. After the war, Towns became a professor at Columbia University, where his experience in radar led him to the idea for the Maser, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, a device that transformed microwaves into an intense, coherent stream. There were skeptics. Bohr, Niels Bohr, a very famous physicist, and I was visiting him in in Denmark and walking along the street with Niels Bohr and Niels Bohr said, what are you doing? I said, well, we've just made the maser, I call it, which is producing very pure frequencies from ammonia molecules, amplifying very pure frequencies. He said, oh, well, no, that's not possible. But it was possible. Einstein was the one who pointed out how these atoms work, you see. They absorb or they're stimulated and emit. Einstein didn't foresee amplification, but he understood the mechanisms, the quantum mechanical mechanisms. Maser technology led to the laser, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, created by manipulating the quantum state of atoms, forcing them to emit a concentrated beam of light. Light energy can be visualized as a procession of waves traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Light waves differ in frequency and intensity. We know these differences as the colors of the rainbow. Normal light sprays out in all directions, a jumble of many frequencies or colors, like the sound wave jumble we call static. A laser amplifies light wave energy and organizes it into an intense beam, a kind of light that doesn't exist in nature, coherent light. Coherent light waves march in step, like the sound waves of a pure tone. I was primarily interested in scientific uses uh, and so on. 
Nevertheless, I could see a lot of very important uses, such as, such as communications. In addition, very high power, very concentrated power. You could burn things and weld things and cut them and so on. I could foresee a lot of things. On the other hand, on the other hand there are many things I didn't foresee, such as medical use. It never occurred to me it would be very useful medically, but it is. In 1964, Charles Towns shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on maser and laser devices. From 1966 until 1970, Towns was chairman of NASA's Science Advisory Committee for the Apollo Lunar Landing Program. And in 1967, he accepted a position at the University of California at Berkeley and entered a new discipline. I came out here in order to do astronomy. I decided I could see some new things to be done in astronomy that other people were missing. For example, microwave astronomy. It's been a very important field now. And I found a way of using lasers to do astronomy in the infrared, particularly to measure the size of stars. The general public is interested in scientific discovery, but often has a short attention span. I think they, they're kind of interested in discoveries of physics and astronomy and so on, but they don't recognize its importance economically. And even the, the politicians can't support science very, so strongly because it isn't going to pay off immediately. It pays off many years later now. For example, the maser and the laser. The, the laser is now billions of dollars of business, but it's been about 50 years. It frequently takes about 20 years for scientific discovery to begin to pay off heavily. I think many people don't recognize that engineering contributes to science, science contributes a great deal to engineering. The interaction between them is very, very important. The measure required the combination of an oscillator and quantum mechanics, and so they sort of lasers. And that's, it's that combination which produces the new ideas. Towns has influenced many younger scientists. Otto Penzias was a student of mine, and he discovered the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. What could be more important than to find out the universe had a beginning? Now, that impacts our philosophy a great deal. Towns is known for his views on the compatibility of science and religion. I don't think there's any basic conflict between the two. Science is an attempt at understanding how the universe works. Religion is an attempt to understand how it began and what is the meaning. What is it that God created? Well, it has to be very, very specially constructed. Fantastic laws of science have to come out exactly the way they are for us to be here. In 2005, the Templeton Prize for progress toward research or discoveries about spiritual realities was awarded to Charles Towns. He is the only person other than the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa to win both a Templeton Prize and a Nobel Prize. Let me just ask you, what's your secret for staying so active so late in life? Is it just well, exercise? Just, uh, having a good time, having a good time exploring. Exploring, solving puzzles and exploring things and so on. It's a, it's a great life. I feel very lucky to be able to do this. Here he is later in life talking about what he believes is the false dichotomy between science and religion. My other research has done a variety of things. I've worked in physics, of course, invented a laser, and, uh, and I've worked in astronomy, trying to understand stars and the universe and what it's like. I just like to explore. Science is an exploration of what things are like. Why they're that way, you see, that's more of a religious question. And the two are complementary. And I appreciate both of them. I think they're very, both very important. Science uh, tries to understand things in great detail, what they are and how they work and so on. And that's very interesting, fascinating. But, but why? That's still a deeper question. And that's a religious question. Why the way they are? Why did it begin? Why is the universe here? Why, why are we here? And why the laws of science just come out the way they are so we can be here? Oh, those are very deep questions. Well, I think the apparent friction between science and religion is kind of artificial. I see no reason for any real friction between the two, but some people like to make it that way. Some scientists just don't want to believe in religion, so they try to make arguments of why religion can't be there, you see. Uh, I see no reason for that. I think the two are quite consistent with each other. Science describes what things are and why they, how, how they work. Religion describes why they're here and why they work that way. See, the two are quite complementary. Einstein once said, oh, the universe couldn't have had a beginning. And then he finally recognized, yes, it did have a beginning. After all, it had a beginning. It got created. Why was the universe created? And why was it created the way it is? It has to be almost, the laws of science have to be almost exactly the way they are for us to be here. Why did it happen to turn out that way? But see, that suggests that there was a plan and a design. And that's a religious view. The design of 
what this world is all about, and why it is the way it is. That's the meaning of religion. Science is just trying to describe what it is and how it works, but not why. Religion is trying to understand why. Why is it here? And how did it begin? And what is the plan? Why did it turn out the way it is? More integration and interaction between the two, yes, in the future, is we really are more and more minded and deeper in our thinking. Everybody should think very hard about what this is all about. You know, what is it like? And why is it this way? That's a very deep question. Well, that's the question of religion, you see. What's it all about? Here in December of 1964, in Stockholm, he's awarded his Nobel Prize. Dr. Towns, Dr. Prokhorov, Dr. Basov, by your ingenious studies of fundamental aspects of the interaction between matter and radiation, you have made the atoms work for us in a new and most remarkable way. These magic devices called masers and lasers have opened up vast new fields for research and application, fields that are now being exploited with increasing intensity in many laboratories all over the world. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I extend to you our warm congratulations, and now I ask you to receive the Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. Thank you very much for coming. Finally, Dr. Towns talks about his aha moment, the one moment that all the scientists like him get in Washington, D.C. in the early 1950s. See, I had been working very hard, thinking of different ways, some ways of producing short waves. And I'd even been made a chairman of a department, a chairman of a committee, rather, for the country, to try to examine how to, how to produce short waves. And our committee traveled around and looked at what people were trying to do and so on. We just didn't come up with any good ideas. So we would have our last meeting in Washington, D.C. Just before that last meeting, I woke up early in the morning because I was worried about it. We hadn't been able to do anything. I went out. I sat in the park. It was a beautiful day, and the flowers were blooming. I sat on the bench, and I said, why haven't we been able to do this? And I went through all the possibilities we had thought of, you see, and I had thought of. Things I had tried, and this didn't work, and this didn't work very well. Why can't we do it now? Well, I thought, you know, if we could get radiation from molecules, molecules can produce very short wavelengths, but how can you do it? Ah, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, this is the way to do it. Oh, yes, we can do it from molecules. Uh, we get molecules in the right kind of state, and that can happen. Ah, and it was exciting. It was exciting, and I went back to my hotel room, and I was in the same hotel room with Arthur Shallow, who was a postdoc with me at the time. I told him about it. He said, oh, well, yeah, that sounds, sounds all right. And I went back to Columbia, and after a little while, I got a student to work on it, and uh, we eventually made it work. Well, I guess you could say that was the moment at which Dr. Towns saw the light. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And in closing tonight, I'm going to play a song from another great American Southerner who fused his art with his religion also. To honor Dr. Towns, here is the 1948 version of the classic written and sung by Hank Williams called I Saw the Light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light.